So science, as I said a moment ago, is really the great equalizer. It is the one thing that stands between, say, two brothers with as much power as these two brothers have, Charles and David Koch, uh, and two brothers that have as much as these two have, my nephews in Chicago. Now, in theory, uh, these two sets of brothers uh, in the United States should have uh, the same access to justice, the same access to uh, potentially to education or to employment, uh, or at least to voting. Uh, and science is the one equalizer that neutralizes the vast size of the megaphone of the brothers on the left side of the screen uh, and provides an opportunity uh, to the brothers on the right. This is based on some core ideas that really date back to the very, very founding of the United States. Thomas Jefferson said, wherever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. And there is really the crux of some of the problem that we're running into. If you uh, have ever been down to the Library of Congress, you will have seen probably uh, Thomas Jefferson's library that's recreated there, nice round space, round bookcases, and which contained uh, virtually the entirety of human knowledge at the time. And he had read all of those books and contained that in his mind. He was a scientist and an attorney, uh, sort of like Francis Bacon was. Uh, and that was a possible idea back then, the well-informed voter. But what happens now, nearly a quarter, cent, uh, nearly a, a quarter millennia later, uh, when science has continued to advance and it's not at all possible for one person to know even a fraction of all that there is to know? How do we have well-informed voters that are able to govern themselves successfully in a democracy in the age dominated by complex science and technology? That's the rub that we're bumping up against. Well, in order to come up with this idea for democracy, to convince other Enlightenment nations to not intercede in the Revolutionary War, Jefferson reached for the greatest thinking of what he called his trinity of three greatest men to come up with an argument that would convince him to stay out. He went to the thinking of Isaac Newton, uh, inventor at the time of physics, who said a man may imagine things that are false, but he can only understand things that are true. And this is part of where we're getting into trouble today. Because if you take out your cell phone and turn it over and unscrew the Phillips screws that are on the back, wait a minute, there are no Phillips screws on the back. It's hard to have know-how. It's hard to understand things that are true when science and technology have become so complex that it's difficult for the average person to break them down. A generation ago, you could sit down at your uh, kitchen table and you could buy a kit and you could make a radio. That's no longer true with cell phones. So at the moment that, that cell phones, which like flying brooms are made by people cloistered away wearing long robes and uttering strange incantations, right? At the moment that science becomes indistinguishable from magic, we become vulnerable to disinformation campaigns because science, by its very nature, must become, uh, in a way, a function of belief. And it's what do you believe in? Scientists choose to believe in journals and the peer review process. But even those are vulnerable, as we've seen lately uh, from certain for-profit journals and journals for hire. <clears throat> 